вами игр, компании, которая до этого никогда этим не занималась, при этом имела собственные в студии свои процессы разработки и так далее. И при выходе на онлайн рынок компании пришлось пересмотреть практически все, чем она занималась, включая процесс разработки, программное обеспечение, бизнес-модели. То есть было целая куча изменений в рамках компании Каборджа. Винсент является, простите мне, такой сленг, кофандером или софаундером, да, или соунером, основателем Каборджа. Собственно говоря, Винсент как раз вот прошел весь путь адаптации компании, которая занималась доунлодовыми играми, в онлайн-бизнес. При этом Каборджа стала довольно известной компанией и успешной. Винсент рассказал про этот успех и что им удалось сделать и как изменить процесс, чтобы быть успешным. Винсент, прошу. Thank you very much. But, but don't applaud yet. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen yet. Um, so hi, uh, for the English speakers, I'm Vincent, and I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Kobojo. Um, um, this presentation is about what one of the key lessons that we had for the last two years, trying to make social games. So actually, the The title of that show was, uh, that presentation was service-based, but it's more specifically social game-based. Um, um, so let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about Kobojo. So um, we, uh, we are 75 people today based in Paris. So bear with my accent, I'm sorry. Um, we, uh, we have been doing things on Facebook since 2008. Um, we are around 4 million in the EU. Actually, that number is not real anymore. We, Facebook has changed the way they change it. For some reason, it's lower. It's okay. And we uh, we have made a, a fairly large uh, first um, raise in April of uh, 5.3 million euro. We have two main games, one called Pyramidville and the other one called Goobox. Um, and it's actually of Pyramidville that I'm going to talk the most um, um, in this presentation. So, the question is, how are most games made today? And when I mean, when I say games, I'm actually not talking about online games. I'm actually talking about um, the what games used to be and are still actually, uh, I would say, in, in the more classical field. Um, this is pretty much the equation uh, that we are used to recently. Uh, a big amount of money, two to four years, and a big unknown. Um, and I'm speaking from a French entrepreneurship and a French uh, you know, video game, um, game studio. I've seen a lot of my friends closing down their store, um, literally their game studio, because of that equation. Because um, it, we are in the logic of the one hit games and we spend so much time and money and energy in that black box that is this game studio that um, If we fail, we fail. And I, since uh, June, from from like from December last year to June this year, three video game companies in France have closed exactly because of that question mark on the equation. So one way to mitigate that risk for the most successful one, uh, you know, we know all of them. One way to do that is to basically narrow the demography. Uh, I'm going to make a game for a target that I understand very well. I'm going to make a game for male. In this case, I'm going to make a game for female, 13, 17, fashion designer, princess, etc. This way, I know that all my energy and all the brainstorm is targeted to a very specific point, and I reduce my risk to fail in that big gamble. Also, when I'm going to spend my marketing money, which I have no choice but spend it anyway, I know where I'm going to spend it. When you look at uh, social games, you actually have something more like that. It's not pink, it's not black, there's no big guns, there's no pink pony, there's no basically, um, we're on a much larger um, demography. Well, we call, I mean, we call it cross-gender games. And why? I mean, why will social games um, change something that has been still working pretty well independently of the risks Uh, created by this big gamble. I mean, we have 15 years of history proving that 
outside of an, even of the field of making games, if you want to make a game or if you want to make a product, you need to have a very specific target. Why would they like kind of open up this thing? Well, <laughs> to understand that stuff and to understand that choice, I just wanted to step back a little bit and, and understand where organic traffic comes from uh, on the web and on, and on social network. Organic acquisition is key to any company because organic acquisition is free and if you do it well, it also reduces the amount of money you'll spend on marketing money itself because for one guy that you buy, you won't get one but you get three, three or something like this. Uh, so it divides the price that you actually pay for one. On the web, the organic stuff is from web search. I have a guy typing on, on a search engine, 3D Indian games. I happen to have a 3D Indian games. Well, this guy expressed a very strong intention. I can ask pretty much anything to that person. I can ask to install um, a plugin. I can ask to even like fill up like 20 pages if I'm a dating website. And the guy will do it because I'm single and I'm looking for someone. I express a very strong intention. On social networks, things are extremely different. People are coming organically from referral. Sarah, my best friend, is sending me a request to come to that game or to that app. I have no idea what it is yet, but it's Sarah that's bringing me here. I come there with no intention and therefore actually no qualification. When I say qualification, I'm not uh, talking about skills. I'm talking about what you would expect in terms of demographic, you know. When, I'm, when I make a 3D Indian games, I'm pretty sure that the guy coming to my door is a male, 20, uh, 18, 35-ish, you see, right? he's qualified. I mean, he, I know where he is. Unqualified in that slide means that they can be anywhere in the spectrum. They can be male, female, they can be seven years old, I mean, no, 13 years old on Facebook, um, 80, you have no idea. So. The impact of that change in the way you have organic acquisition obviously comes down to this kind of game. You want cross-gender games to maximize your organic acquisition. That sounds kind of a fair deal. You know, there's, I'm, I don't know who I'm going to have at the door. I know that I can have a lot. So let's kind of, let's try to open this thing as much as I can without going into cliche and niche. By, by taking such a stand, you're also in one of the, like any marketing guy will tell you, this is wrong. A game for everyone is a game for no one. And he's right, you know, like try to make a product for everyone. Like, were are you trying to sell this thing for everyone? Nah. Let's talk tomorrow morning. So the question is, we still have to live with that. We still have to live with that finding that we need to make game for everyone. So with as much risk as it is, in a very different kind of risk. Um, how do we manage that? Well, so it's, you know, uh, we're not inventing this and I'm just w one other guy using that, that method, but I'm just here to talk about what we've learned of lean development for the last two years. Um, the idea of lean is simple. Um, think big, act small, fail fast, learn rapidly. Wonderful. Uh, I didn't invent that, by the way. This is, I go on wiki, uh, Wikipedia, Lean Software Development, you'll get that. Um, but I think this is very powerful and this is something that we need to have. So basically, we're like completely inversing the way we mitigate risk in this kind of field. In the other side, they don't have much choice and spending a lot of time in a cubicles for two to four years and a lot of money. In our side, we're gonna do the other way around. We have to open up, so we're gonna short term as much as we can, um, the time we're gonna spend on that. And so thing being, I mean, I'm not gonna teach you what's thinking being, I think everyone here makes game, um, and thing being when they make a game. What's harder is the act small. It's really hard to act small. When you have that idea, you're brainstorming and you're used to make games, um, you're used to make games for years that you have no choice but to be burned on a DVD or uh, on something that needs to be on a shelf. There's no way you can come back to it. So it's really hard to break that mindset that we have had for years, which is we need to have a perfect product. 
we, we need it. Otherwise, the press is going to kill us, the people, we're not going to sell. And I'm saying that because we have hired some producers with 15 years of industry and it took, it took them a lot of time to break that mindset and, and to read, like, what, am I going to make a game in three months? Are you crazy? What? This is impossible. And yes, it is. So one way to do it is, and that's the artist past, what is your minimum viable product? What, how do you define what is the smallest subset of your game that is good enough to be launched, successful enough, um, knowing that you will keep developing after anyway. You are not burning CDs on a shelf. You are like in a live product. And identifying that MVP basically will help you short term as much as you can your first iteration. And this is a very important um, you know, cursor to, to use because as short you can have your first iteration, the less risk you can take. And basically the faster you can fail and the quicker you can learn. So this is what we've do. This is very humble, you know, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm just sharing with you um, how we do it basically. So we spend basically a month of game design. Um, the way we choose themes, because we're like, the co-founder team was not a marketing team. We're like more of an IT slash artist type of guy, classic. So the theme we decided basically to go through polling. We decided we already have a subset of users and you know, take 10 themes and put them to in front of the users. Which one do you like? And that's how we choose the theme of Pyramidville. Actually, Pyramidville was not the first one, it was the second one. The first one was um, um, Jungle. And right at the time we worked on this stuff, there was like a jungle farming game, and we thought, ah, there is some jungle already out there. Pyramid, that's interesting. Nobody has done Pyramid. And very, uh, very, very strangely, stuff came up, so okay, let's go for that. And we worked like on gameplay and, and you know, a first art direction for months. Um, then we have three months of productions. Um, in order to execute three months of production, which is really short, it's very important that you have a clear idea of what is your subset so that you can constantly prioritize and, and not get distracted by the noise of, of the, 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 the bubble of creation that is inside your company and that you want to keep, but, um, but can also be a disadvantage when you are in such a short-term development. And after three months, it's very important not to launch your game yet. Um, we actually spent a month in private beta, so someone, some people call it closed beta, it can be public beta, but the idea is that I am not publicizing yet my game because it's not done yet. And um, the idea of the lean development is that I'm gonna push as far as I can the decision of which feature will I make, uh, which tuning will I keep, and, and how am I gonna, um, how are we gonna basically um, optimize that game? And so that month of private beta is still key in the development phase. The day one we launched Pyramidville, we already had 217 KPI, we spent, uh, and if you have the right tooling, it took us three days to install them. They are very simple, you know, you log this with that title and that number. If you have just the right backend to treat this, it's actually very efficient. Um, and when we launched the game, we were capable to observe and then adjust and iterate again and again and again. Uh, MVP is therefore not feature complete, but it must be pixel perfect. You always hear, I mean, I'm not the first guy I probably would talk to you about lean development, but um, you always hear about, you know, do something quick and dirty and see after. What all learning is that if you do make if you make it too dirty, it's not going to work either. You need to be pixel perfect. But pixel perfect is actually rather simple to do. It's just a question of polishing. As long as you get a good subset of the feature that you want to have in that pixel perfect world. So when we launched Pyramidville, basically you could visit, but you had no interaction with your neighbors. 
we only had content for the next two months. We had no collections, no achievements, but we were pixel perfect. And we had something rather good looking, I mean, for, for, for the type of game that we wanted to have. At least we were happy enough with it and proud enough of it to launch it. And it still worked. We were still missing what, like, achievements? You don't have achievement, but this is core, you know, like some people are like begging for achievement. They are achievers, they need achievement. S yet, if you don't have achievement, but if you have the right core stuff, this thing is working. And we basically spent the next two months bringing up what was lacking in the game, depending on who were the players and who they were. And, um, and we were surprised to who the other player, I'll come back to that after, but we start, We actually started to develop things that we would never thought we would have to develop because we actually kind of have a mindset of a rather, we're expecting more male coming to that game and we had more, more female doing stuff that we we're not thinking they would. So once you've launched a game, uh, you know, observe, listen and observe. So. I, so I've put, first of all, I've put the word observe twice because we've made the mistake to think there was like three listen and one observe. Listen means that you're actually literally listening to the voice of your users through, um, through forums, uh, through your community managers, through emails, and you have this um, feed of stuff coming up in that's gonna basically make some noise and influence what you're gonna do next because you're in a constant iteration. So what am I gonna do next? And it's very easy to kind of constantly like, oh my God, oh my God, the users are asking her for this thing. They're gonna leave, they're gonna leave. If, they, if we don't do that, they're gonna leave. And and it's it's a normal thought to have, but we, it, we discovered that it's better to spend twice more time observing what they do rather than listening to what they want. Because a player will want to be able to fly in a 3D world where he's not supposed to, or like, for example, we constantly have users complaining about the fact that we don't we don't give them hard currency. And it's fair enough; it's part of the game design. But after three months, some my game designer are like, no, Vincent, we need to give hard currency in the game. Like, like the people is so complaining about the fact they don't have gems. We need to give some. So. And so you're like, oh, okay, 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 let's do this. You know, like, how do we do that? How do we give hard currency? Well, maybe we can give hard currency when they level up. You know, there's only like 50 levels. It's just 50 gems. What is 50 gems after all? You know, like, well, 50 gems is actually um, it's actually six dollars in in our world, and it's actually a lot when you think about it. If you give six dollars to every single of your users, um, but yeah, I guess we did it. We actually implemented that stuff. It was a failure, it was a failure. We kept having more complaints about more stuff and uh, the people asking for gems were stopped asking for gems, but we actually started to sell well, sell less basically because we're starting to give away. So listening is not always what you want to do even though it's so tempting to like um, do everything they want you to do. Observing though is much more interesting. But the question is what am I observing? Because everybody talk about it. Okay, so lean is develop fast and observe. But oh, all right, let's observe. But we, it took us a while to figure out what we wanted to observe. And the first thing we observe when we launch our game is obviously retention. Before anything else, before monetization, before variety, is the first thing that we want to look at. Um, and more specifically, obviously, your first time user funnel. You know, we mentioned earlier that people coming in are, um, they have no intention. They are literally just landing on your game. They don't even know what it is. Um, they had no idea they will play it five minutes ago. So that's finally so important. So the first question is, does the player even reach your game? And it took us a while to actually figure that question. We were first like, okay, how are they playing the game? Uh, Oh, they're, 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 they're putting crops, it's great, they're putting crops, it's more crops. But the question is that we didn't see, because we didn't have this indicator, are they actually reaching the game? And I'm saying this because our first game was a first cool 3D game. So we're like, yeah, how can we make such a cool game? So it was 
literally a 3D games in Flash because we already knew that we wanted we we couldn't have like uh, stuff. So we decided to go for Flash. But have you tried to make 3D in Flash? Pfft, don't even. I mean, Flash 11 is great. Before that, I mean, if there are people laughing, they probably know the pain we had to. Um, we ended up with a huge initial file, seven mega, that was unbreakable. We tried the uh, best R&D guy tried to break up this stuff, but paper cut was terrible, and it was awfully slow to load, <laughs> and it failed. We actually had more than 50% of people not even reaching the game, uh, just because they were stuck for a minute and a half to two minutes just waiting for the seven megabyte to be loaded. Um, and when you have no intention, they had no idea that on the left side there's a 3D cool world. What they see is that this stuff, like I, Sarah just asked me to go there, it's bloody slow, like, ah, whatever. Like I was doing, I was sending an email, I'm going back to my email. So the key that we had to take out on this, that the first load time is absolutely crucial and we decided to stream as much as we can, literally everything, everything. And um, we, we had the mindset of being able to launch Pyramid in less than 10 seconds, and we did so, and it worked great. Uh, basically, the game launched, there is a lot of missing assets, but the game is launched. There is something I can start clicking, I have a pop-up, I'm starting to engage, and there's some fuzzy stuff in the background, it's popping up, but ah, it's okay, we are, you know, there is a pop-up and I'm guided through this thing. Then there's the question of um, where am I losing them after that? So after that, um, we actually have tutorial pop-up. You know, you're thinking, okay, all right. They come here, they don't know anything about my game. I absolutely need to take their hands and help them. So actually we took the stand not to have uh, a rail, uh, you know, like something with a, black everywhere and a, and a hole, it's actually just missions. Mission telling you, go get this, do that, and one by one teaching you. And so that curve is basically like about 30 hours, so you can see like a nice 24 hour of, um, of people coming in. And um, every line is a player completing that specific missions or specific tutorial mission. And so very, click, very quickly when we launched the game, we saw that there was like specific gaps in, in certain missions that we needed to fix. And it's such a wonderful tool. You know, we are consuming your game on a console. Um, maybe you're gonna look at, you know, at some, at some, you know, 10 guy playing the game, having a video, and things. but here you have like hundreds of players giving you that information. What we discovered here in, in this stuff, it was the first one that was really problematic was the first buy in the market, the first buy in the shop. So why? So we said, okay, people are not finding the shop. Let's add this, you know, an image in the pop-up at the beginning to teach them how does the market look like? You know, this, this, this is the market, this is the button it shouldn't look like. Ah, fell. Didn't work. So we thought, okay, well, let's make this thing blink. Blinking is wonderful, it attracts my eyes. And it started to blink. Didn't work. We still have the same gap. We're like, what is going on? Like, blinking should work. And it took us another day like, of frustration and trying to actually discover in a meeting room that if you have a small screen, there is a very nice cut, a perfect cut with the fold because our early top bar was too big. And it was just such a nice cut. There's just no way that the guy could even imagine he had to scroll. It was a perfect end of the flash. We added a huge bigger row that basically will go over the... the and success. But in order to do that, we needed to have the right tooling and the right capacity to, as soon as we put in production, to have um, something like this, which is, um, so this is an internal tool that's runtime analytics that tells what's going on right now in the game. And, and this is extremely powerful for this kind of, of, of tuning. Um, 
it's quite limited once you want to go into marketing observation and stuff. You know, there's no segmentation, but it's very powerful to show you um, to show yourself. So we fixed our first time user funnel, and um, so once you have a better retention after your first day, then you need to say, okay, I need to start making money. Uh, is this stuff cost me a, lo a lot of money? And uh, so back to the basics. Uh, you don't know with your audience and you've built something large enough to try to catch as much as you can but uh, who is really going to stick you don't know yet and you need to adapt to it. As I was saying earlier we're surprised to see that over 70% of female uh, wear the stickier and the pyramid bill and that's where lean is great because we were 10 guys making that game and suddenly there is so 70% of like at the, at, at the launch, 1.2 million Australian three people were female playing made by 10 guys. Woo! Um, but my point here is that um, as soon as you discover your audience, you really need, you really need to adapt to it and, and make some drastic changes. And you need to basically to expose that data, expose that fact strongly enough to your team so that the message is passed. And let me tell you the story of one of our events. We decided to do a world music day. Sounds like a great idea for like item selling avatars and stuff. That sounds like great stuff. And we decided to, uh, to sell that. Do you see anything wrong with those three avatars? So let me tell you, this is Michael Jackson on the left, Kiss in the middle, Elvis Presley on the right. None are for females. And you know what? We discovered that after we put that in production, damn, there's no avatar for females. And we only own females. And we are selling nothing. And, and, and this happened, you have no idea how this is so easy to happen in your, in, your production, in your production cycle. You have your 10 guys sitting around the table. What's our next event? Oh, man. Let's make a music day event. Oh yeah, there's gonna be kiss in that. That's gonna be so great. Oh yeah, I really like Elvis. Cool, let's do that. Let's ask the artist and boom, 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 boom. This is, a, this is happening, you know. Since then, our product manager is a female and that was a great change. And the first thing she told us is that you guys have no pink items. You have 70% female and you have a, not a single pink item in your, in your selling store. What are you doing? Uh, <laughs> you're so right. <laughs> well, come on board, please take a seat. Um, so, so those are those were pretty harsh lesson um, because you know those even take a lot of time and energy to be made, and they obviously have no revenue um, or like not that much. One event that worked really well, though, that was our best one, and I thought that sh I should share that with you. Uh, we did an event with the Prince Charles, uh, no, not the Prince Charles, uh, what was their names? The new, uh, you know, the, um, thank you so much, William and Kate. We decided, oh, what a great event. We, so we, we create like it, four items, you see, like uh, those, like a, a table, uh, banks and, and stuff and some avatar things. We never made so much money during that event. It sold, in, and we had like a small scenario, three missions, very simple to do, where you have to organize the, the wedding of your daughter. <laughs> Incredible. So, um, again, think about your content. And I have a great story. I don't know if you know that game, Backyard Monster. And um, so they started, you know, they actually, they're, they're, they're uh, I've never met them, so if you're here, I'd be very happy to chat after. But um, I've, I've, I've looked at from from the outside, you know, from 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 one who do who do the same thing, and um, they have they have done games for quite a while, and uh, they decided to go on Facebook. It was the new thing to do, but they they were also told like you know, go on Facebook. It has to be casual, you know, affordable for everyone. And I think they went a little too far in the cartoony stuff. And this is how the game title looked like: Backyard Monster. Looks rather funny, uh, engaging. I went there and I play actually at that time. I couldn't find screenshot of that time. And there was this um, 
it was some, some kind of a management game with a little bit of tower defense. They had a passing tower defense. But for me, it was, I, I found it was rather small and, uh, and, and under-evaluated. Well, they probably discover rather quickly that only men were sticking to this. Because four months after, Backyard Monster became that and became a massive success. And they raised $18 million shortly after. That means that they are the good version, they made that make them good money. And I think this is a very, very good example why Lean in this field is really good. Because if they spent two years making that games, they probably couldn't have not, like, the, first of all, if you spend two years making a game, you're so attached to it. You know, you spend two years every morning thinking how it's gonna look like. You're so attached to it that the idea of changing it to something hardcore like that, are you serious? Man, for two years I've been thinking little green monsters, and now you want to put blood everywhere. How am I gonna, no, I, you can't ask me to do that. Like, so the less time you spend on it, um, the, the more fresh you are and the less attached you are to, to what you're creating to actually direct your product to something that, um, that finds the public and, um, and, and that actually works. Now, virality. Um, so, your user is sticking, you're making money during good events and good monetization, but you still need to go higher, you know, uh, in terms of in terms of people, because uh, there is this mathematics stuff that says, you know, you have a two person conversion rate at uh, ten dollar RPP, you you need more people in, um, and this is what most of, and that's what we thought when we started two years ago, um, make your game part of the platform. That sounds quite right. I'm gonna make my game part of the platform. Where What we realize is that this is wrong. And what you need to think is that I'm gonna make the platform part of my game. And, uh-huh, what the hell does it mean, Vincent? Well, this is what making a game part of the platform means. I have a game. Uh, it could be a PC game, it could be a game coming from anything. And I just put it on Facebook and add a share button. My game is part of the platform, it's sunny stuff, but the platform is not part of my game yet. Um, there is, and it's funny that they probably like, we're trying like, I beg you, it's so cool dude, it's so awesome, click on that button, ah! But like, oh, you're level two, like you just arrive in the game that you don't know, you barely made like three clicks, you're level two and you're expected to click, click on a button share. This is just not working. It, it can't work, like, I mean, it's, it's a cool idea, but it's just not gonna work. Um, and also, and, and, and that's actually the, the, the thing that I've heard a lot is that, um, feeds, like, oh, I have feeds in my stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm viral, I'm feeds, I'm, part, I'm, I'm on Facebook, dude. Um, well, being the platform part of your game means a strong game design integration of the platform and not a simple share button, not a simple um, use of the communication channel. And this is one look like. Um, so you are in Pyramidville and you're asked to, to build a diamond mine. It's one of those cool stuff that's animated, that's kind of core to the game. It's not asked all the time, but time to time you need to build one of those cool buildings. Um, and the way it's we, we design it is that there is like four, um, there's four resources that you can get yourself. But there's two that are social gift. And this is so much more powerful than a share button. I am level 10, I'm really engaged, and I'm told now that I either spend like a dollar six, a dollar sixty to, to advance, or I can ask my friend. I'm gonna ask my friend. It's obvious, and I'm so engaged that I'm not gonna be like, oh man, I just, I just started that game. Pff, I don't even know if it's good or not. I'm not gonna bother my friends. Uh, no, I'm too ashamed of it. No, I'm now engaged, and I really want that diamond mine. And the result is um, is here. Um, orange, feed install. Green, gift install. 
during that same day, you see the proportion I have from, uh, from feeds. There is also a reason to that, that's kind of historical, is that feeds were once a very powerful installation feature and they become a retention feature because Facebook, for those who are not familiar to the platform, um, um, decided s slowly but surely to reduce their powerness. It was first in October 2009, I think, where they decided not to show every single feed on the wall. They, they used to before. Um, then they had that black box stuff where basically you needed to interact. So we had a phase in 2010 where it was all about what am I going to put in my feed so that people interact with it. Um, and there was that great story, um, one of the feed uh, from a game from Playdom, uh, Sorority Life was um, that you could stall the boyfriend of your, of your um, you could stall the boyfriend of one of your girlfriend. And so it was a wonderful feed saying, uh, Jessica just stole the boyfriend of, uh, of Marianne. And this stuff made them extremely, um, ex um, extremely viral for a while because there were so many chat. Oh my God, Jessica, you're kidding now. <laughs> you stole his boyfriend. So very powerful stuff. But, but things changed again. And more recently, um, Facebook has decided that feeds should only be shown to people who have already installed the game. So it became only a retention uh, features and, and a lot of newcomers on Facebook don't really realize that. So feeds are not enough for that reason. Um, this is the end of my presentation. To conclude quickly, um, you want to stay agile with a minimum viable product. Um, you want to think cross-gender to maximize your reach. I just want to, um, to undermine one thing about that is that um, you can also, and some people have done that very successfully, um, not, go, not go the cross-gender way purposely. But you have to keep in mind that you're not going to be viral. So you're going to spend, you're going to spend a lot of time on monetization. And it can still be a very profitable game if, and Kabam have done that greatly. Um, if your game is, uh, let's say, only for males, don't even try to be viral. Don't even, don't, don't just work on, on a very deep game. Um, but know that you will need cash to, uh, to start, to bootstrap this thing. If you make it well, then cash will come naturally from within the game, but you, but you will need cash to bootstrap the start of the game. Um, so this crush under approach is the one from Kubo Joe, uh, but might not be the only truth. Um, know how to refocus your efforts once you find your niche. Again, um, I think I've shown you how today and good example on, on why it can make you successful. Um, success goes further than porting. I've seen a lot of uh, small uh, Facebook entrepreneur or online entrepreneur fail because of the lack of, of because of porting. Actually not fail, like, like they closed the company, but um, you can't just take your game that existed on PC and just uh, put it on Facebook. It needs more if you want it to be successful. Um, and I showed you how by basi basically not only using, by using those channel part of the game design. And finally, think, code, observe, and iterate. I think that's the key to it. Um, it comes with some, some, I mean, thing that I don't touch here in that presentation, but some great deal of organization because hyper iteration is really complicated. It's, 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 a, it's very powerful when you get it right, um, but it asks for a lot of process and you know, you think agile, et cetera. But we went too far in agile. We went to a, to a point at some point at Kobo Joe where we didn't know what we were doing next week. And basically what, if we don't release this thing, then it means that, oh my God, for the last weeks we haven't released something and oh, this is like, so we were so agile to a point that it was something wrong for the game. So thinking agile doesn't mean that you, you, you don't know what you do tomorrow. You still need to have a long plan that you will check the priorities depending on your findings and your stuff. So you, you still need a, a roadmap. Um, don't get stuck in the hyper agile to agile kind of thing where you have no content. Um, and that's it. Now, more questions?
Christensen. How many users did you uh, acquire organically before you turned on market? Actually, the Koboju, I mean, so Koboju is a specific story. We used to buy, to have up to 10 million MAU in October 2009, right before those changes. So uh, the company, and those were like purely viral um, application. Um, more recently, uh, we have started to do acquisition um, when we try to reach new countries. So basically, we this 2009, we decided to focus only in France. The English market was already saturated. So many guys already there in two, like two years ago. And we found great success by making French games. And so we started to build a really, really strong and big French community that costs us like $5,000 overall, like nothing. Um, and it's only recently when we raised um, some capital that we decided basically to, um, to spend some marketing money to on a specific, um, not demographic, but a specific uh, language, trying to reproduce this language capacity that we are in the French market, but on other markets. And successfully so far, but there's some bump in the road. It's, uh, what's, what's really hard is that, um, it's actually, we haven't, we haven't made it profitable yet though, is that we have managed to build, a, we have managed to build, you know, uh, a seed of user that grew up organically um, but because your seed can't be as big as you know the the, the hundred thousand that you have accumulated before, that it takes more cash, and it's it's very tempting to keep going even though you don't make money because you want you want numbers and DAU and it's a public number. And I mean, in my case, my VC like one public number. So like that. But the truth is that it's all you have to like find the right cursor between having enough people to start to bootstrap your game and the actual. Uh, revenue out of it. And I'd say it's, it's, it's really hard if you start from scratch today. Um, pure, purely from scratch. I would say that focus on a specific language and it might not be English. Um, because English is so expensive. Um, the, everybody is competing you know, on this bid system for buying users that it's gonna be really hard to find a, a return on investment on, on acquisition on those. And um, it's actually a story that uh, um, I think Ravio had the same for the launch of Angry Birds, starting with small countries. I would say the same. Start with uh, smaller countries. Actually, France is a good one, um, but there are others. You know, maybe in Europe or um, or maybe targeting a specific country, um, and where the acquisition is, is smaller, and see if the game takes. And uh, what's the, what's the revenue that you have per user? Can you, you know, by iteration make it higher? If there's anything, and if if you reach a point where it's um, profitable, then you can bring the millions behind and the, the funnel will be positive always. So that's, that was our, yeah. Okay. Hi. Ah, sorry, he has a, I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, uh, do you think it's objective for you are now, if you wouldn't, get any investment. If I didn't get what, sorry? Okay. Do you think you would be as successful as you are now subjectively if you didn't uh, get initial investment? If I didn't get initial investment? Actually, yeah. Uh, because the investment we got was just to accelerate. When when we, um, I mean, you know, successful, wait, I'm not Zinga. My own success is to hire 20 people and be profitable. And that's already my, uh, I'm like very humble if I really have that, you see what I'm all. But when, when we raised money, we were 20 and, um, and we were profitable every month. And Kobojo were never in the red ever um, up until we invest and, and raise money. So um, again, uh, and we managed to get there with 20 people without a single uh, VC money because we took it slow, we think big, but we had a, a very small iteration. We have we had the luck to have like a co-founding team that knew how to do games, so we didn't have to spend money like convincing people or like buying uh, stuff. We were just the four of us. Uh, but out of this first iteration, we actually started to have something that made money, 
and enough money to hire the next guy and the next guy and and to a point where like okay I'm at 20 I have two games and if I really want to have two more games I need cash because um, I'm like I'm basically flat or like slowly going up in the in my monetization capacity of the current game that I have and and then it, I need investment, and that's that's where we 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 raise capital. So the question was: uh, um, Is your cost of acquisition greater than the lifetime value? I'm, are you losing money on a per user basis? To be honest, on Pyramidville today, yes, it is. But um, it's because uh, I mean, on because it is on market where we didn't have an, or an existing seed. And also because it's harder to get a, a, a positive ROI um, when you only have one product. And do you think a big chunk of your success is the timing you were in in before 2010 when virality turned down? That you grew the business then, and since you know, virality's pretty much gone away. Uh, so um, you, you're now not profitable. Is that sort of related? So yeah, it, it's it's um, it's just that. It's it's very important to have your variety right and to have the proper seed as well. And um, as much as we are not yet profitable on those, they are a really good investment for the twin coming games, because for the twin coming games now we have a base of very viable users that um, that that will launch the next game much more uh, much more efficiently. And I will have a return investment not on one but on three games, and that's visible. Um, if you if you spread up your guys at least on two games, then it becomes it becomes uh, profitable. So for us, I mean, purely talking about Kobojo, I don't know what's the position of others, but in our case, um, we're actually breathing another game in a month, and we know that. Um, I mean, if we get it right, it is our salvation for the current investment we have made in those new countries, or actually new languages, we're targeting. Do you feel that there's a, a bubble with the social games as uh, when you get investment uh, over value or over time? I mean, right now there's a lot of rumors saying that there's a kind of like a bubble growing where VCs are investing but the companies aren't making money. Um, well, uh, our company makes money, and so I don't know about others. I mean, obviously there's a huge buzz, you know, right now. I think there might definitely be a bubble in the valuation of those company, which is regardless of the investment made. Um, or maybe the investment are made because of those valuation of all the company and the promise that of those. But, um, you know, back to reality, like to actually raise money, the guys you'll have to convince have, you know, needs, needs to have some serious conviction that you're going to deliver. And it's going to be more than a PowerPoint slide. It's going to be like, what have you made so far? What, what are the games that you have in the pipeline? How much are you, like, what, what's your organization? And, um, there is definitely a lot of investment made today in, 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 in that field, but also because it's such a new one that it still makes sense. And most of the company that raised money this year, um, I mean, most, were already profitable, I would expect for those VCs. At least that's a trend in Europe. I, don't, I, I can't tell from the US perspective, I'm not in the US. Um, and there might be more like risk investment, but Every European uh, VC that I've met to raise money for Kobojo, like you know, needed like an existing serious result on the company before like investing, and um, you know it's always hard to tell. Uh, how important is usability uh, to the development of your games? Sorry, I didn't hear. How important is usability? Oof so important. Um, we actually, uh, that's actually probably where we spend the most time. Right. Uh, because it's part of the first time user uh, stuff. So it's, it's actually kind of an easy one to tune because it, it's part of, of your first retention uh, uh, wave of optimization. Okay. And um, so, so we switch a lot. We actually don't do that much A-B tests, even though we kind of come, come back to it. Um, you know, everybody, I, I, I do A-B testing, to be honest, I don't do much of it. But um, 
but actually I do change stuff and see if they, if they have an immediate influence on the things. But it's also mostly on um, like, you know, having people in your company cap have capable to like go blank, start new game, like what's my feeling, what's the flow? And I think we spend a lot of time about what is my emotion going out of my first 10 minutes? And if it's right, generally your usability is right. Because even that further than having the right pop-up, I found naturally where it is. Actually, I have a lot of discussion internally from some of my guys who want to innovate. And they want to innovate in UI. And that's the wrong place to innovate. You can innovate in your game design, but in UI, you want to use as much as, much as you can in, the, in what I already know. You know, uh, a scroll bar. I see a scroll bar. I know how to use it. I, I recognize the shape. I recognize two buttons going up and down. I'm going to click on it. But that took me maybe three months of my first use when I was 10 years old to understand that's how I use it properly and how I accelerate. And so you want to use those automatism, especially when you want to go um, very large in terms of. And so <coughs> I'm very often like stopping my guy like, oh yeah, let's, why don't we do this for the UI? I'm like, too complex. Like, I don't understand it. I mean, I might understand it in two hours when I sit down and play more the game, but it's too late. And um, so as much as we try to think forward in terms of gameplay, in terms of content, in terms of um, how we make people interact in the UI, we try to say very, uh, very classic and use mimics and existing stuff. Thank you.